and peace be yours from God through our Savior Jesus Christ. The video uh, prelude that you saw was by English singer-songwriter Dean Dyson and we give Dean thanks for this beautiful native lament. I want to greet you as well with an Ojibwe morning prayer fitting for this day, Indigenous Peoples Sunday and Father's Day. Let us pray. Thank you, Grandfather, 
Thank you, Grandmother, for the shining sun today. I say thank you for today, for giving us life. I say thank you for giving the air we breathe. I say thank you, Mother Earth, for giving us water, for giving us animals, birds and the animals that crawl and the animals that are in the water. Thank you for the four directions, east, south, west, and north. Thank you, Lord. Nagwech. Welcome, one and all, to the service of worship at Central Sanit United Church. Each year at this time, many United Churches and other faith community, communities designate this Sunday as a Sunday to honor Indigenous peoples and to reflect wor worshipfully and prayerfully on Indigenous, non-Indigenous relations. In this time when the terrible legacy of colonial attitudes and institutions, especially Indian residential schools, has been raised in our consciousness and been heavy in our hearts, it is vitally important that we carry on this tradition. Reverend John Snow, our Pacific Mountain Regional Council's Indigenous Minister, and his brother, Reverend Tony Snow, have prepared a video that outlines the history and value of Indigenous Peoples Sunday and I invite you to watch this video now. Today we celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day. This is a historic day for the Treaty 7 area. The day was first introduced by the Stony people in Morley in 1971. On this day, the elders of the Ecumenical Conference in Morley advocated for a day of prayer for Indigenous people. They did this so that we could honor and remember our heritage, our people, and our stories. There is continuing struggle for missing and murdered women. There is continuing struggle for those who feel the effects of residential school. There is continuing struggle for those who grew up in a system of need, in a system of want, who are struggling today to find work, struggling today to find a place in Canadian society. We hope that in some small part, we can do our best to reach out to those community members, to those in need, to help and to be of service as a church body looking to do good in the world. Let us remember that we have gifts to give and that we can share in a future that brings us all together. Oh, O Dangina, o From this historic site along the Bow River, the Stonies worshipped along with the Methodist missionaries and uh, this mission evolved into the United Church. And we've had uh, a history that's been one of experience of good and not so good things. So I think I can share that the Residential school was a thing that was very hard on our people. Today we're part of the reconciliation movement. And when I say that, the church was not aware of things like the treaties. Today we pay homage to the land acknowledgement and we acknowledge we're in Treaty 7 territory of which my family signed the treaties in 1877. We were witness to the apology in 1986 by the United Church. We've seen the 2008 apology by the Harper government and the residential school settlement. Since that time, it's been very dynamic. A lot of changes in attitude in society that have taken place. This includes the release of the Truth and Reconciliation Report and also the acceptance of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People in 2016 by the United Church of Canada. There are many ways to live out your reconciliation story. You can write your Member of Parliament about the Action Plan for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls that has been delayed. 
You can help someone write out their day school application. You can read the caretaker's report and the calls of the church. You can learn more about your treaty in your area. You can invite your community of faith to record their stories of Indigenous outreach. And you can read the TRC calls to action. You can create a heart garden. You can have a watch party on an Indigenous issue and join in a conversation on Zoom. There are also ways to inform yourself to do the work of reconciliation, to reach out to your local friendship center or Indigenous church, to assist with a food drive or children's clothing or school supplies. There's a lot of history to remember. There's a lot of work that the church has done and there's a lot of reconciliation work we need to do. We are witness to an area that had a residential school. I myself am a day school survivor and I wanted to share that even though the history and the abuse has been hard to take and understand, we're working through reconciliation. And by apologizing, the church has said they're ready to work with Indigenous people. And by the country apologizing in 2008, there are opportunities to come together between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. I would say that our calls to action reside inside the Truth and Reconciliation Report and also the articles of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So these form the framework for all denominations of churches to move forward and to work and to remember the history of the Indigenous people. And I hope you will dialogue and begin relationships that are positive with Indigenous people in your area. Learn the history, learn the language, and learn how to relate to one another. So as you can see, there are lots of ways we might walk this long road of reconciliation. I want you to know that our Pacific Mountain Regional Council is giving thought to supporting the plan to construct a healing center on the site of the former Alberni, school, Alberni Residential School. Your council met this past week and is going uh, to think about ways in which we as a congregation might support that particular project. The details will come forward to you at the annual general meeting later this year. A couple more announcements. First, one of celebration that Jack and Margaret Mather celebrated their 60th wedding anniversary this past June 3rd. Congratulations, Jack and Margaret. And of course, I want to offer a word of gratitude and appreciation on this Father's Day for all who provide or who have provided fathering to others. Those men who have given of themselves to care, to love, to mentor, to model Christ-like characteristics to children, grandchildren, and other persons whose lives have been influenced in good ways by your ways. Thank you. 
Next week, we will be celebrating our Pride Sunday with a celebration of our status as an affirming congregation. And guests will include Reverends Allen and Megami Saunders and Reverend David Drake. So please view this online service, which will be available as of June 27th. And now let us acknowledge the land on which this church building sits. It is a land that has been walked on, hunted on, lived on for thousands of years. It is the traditional territory of the Coast Salish peoples. And it is with humility and respect that we give thanks that we are here in the space where we are in touch with the creator who made it and who made humankind. May our worship on this land honor indigenous peoples and may we always remember the story of this land and the original people who have and do still live here. Also the call to live with respect for the land and to live in peace and friendship with all its peoples. May we be among those who are peacemakers and reconcilers traveling the road to just and right relations. We live in the light of Christ, a light that is for all people, not just for a select few. Let us receive this light and shine that light by living with respect with all peoples and with all of creation. And our opening hymn for today's service is Sweet Grass and Candle, words by John Oldham, music by Ron Klusmeyer. Grass and candle, the peace pipe and Bible, the stories of elders and beat of the drum. These are the symbols of hope, faith, and justice. We gather in circle, affirming we're one. Welcome the stranger. Our brother, and she is our sister of mother. Care for creation, for all life is sacred, and we are united by visions rebirth. Join in the circle that will have no ending. For we are all equal and loved in God's sight. Praise the Great Spirit, we gather as family to sing of love's freedom and dance with delight. Welcome the stranger, for he is our brother and she is our sister of mother. For all life is sacred, and we are united by vision's rebirth. Sweet grass and candle, the peace pipe and Bible, the stories of elders and beat of the drum. These are the symbols of hope, faith, and justice. We gather in circle, affirming we're one. We gather in this time of worship to share God's dream of abundant life for all. We gather to give and receive gifts of deep emotion, deep wisdom, and deep love. With gratitude, we gather as a community to praise God, to seek transformation, and to celebrate the power of the Spirit among us. Let us pray. 
Creator God, Great Spirit, we pray our thanks for the opportunity to gather in this sacred hour. In this season after Pentecost, we are aware of the gift of wind. And the four directions from which it comes. In this season of summer, we are aware of the gift of sun. And the four directions on which it shines. In this gathering for worship, we are aware of the gift of humanity. And the four directions in which we exist. In this beautiful land, we are aware of the gift of creation. And the four directions which support our living, breathing, and being. This day, we pray thanksgiving for the First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people of Canada. And we commit ourselves to be people of reconciliation in the tradition of our beloved Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. And our next hymn, Many and Great, O God, Are Your Works, from Voices United 308, originates as a Dakota melody. is with us whether we are inside in the shelter of these walls or outside in the shelter of the trees. God is with us when we gather together and when we are alone. God is with us in the busyness and noise of life. God is with us in stillness and silence. Let us rest in God's love in a moment of quiet. And here today to do the scriptural readings for us are Bill Cole and Nancy Jacobson. 
Let us pray. pray. As As we we hear hear your word read read today, O God, God, open open our hearts and minds to discover your word for us today and help us us interpret and and translate that word into into action action every every day. day. Amen. Amen. In our first passage of scripture, Paul writes to the Philippian congregation, warning them of the danger that threatened their community, the danger of disunity. There is a sense in which that is the danger facing every church and every community. In fact, disunity is a danger that the whole world faces. Ironically, it is when people are really in uh, in earnest, when their beliefs really matter to them, when they are eager to carry out their own plans and schemes that they are apt to get up against each other. The greater their enthusiasm, the greater the danger that they may collide. It is against this danger that Paul wishes to safeguard his friends. Reading from the second chapter of Paul's letter to the Philippians using the message version. If you've gotten anything at all out of following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being in a community of the spirit means anything to you, If you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others and get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. The Gospel reading records two of Jesus' kingdom parables about the growth of seeds. Such growth is steady and sure, and yet is often imperceptible. In the same way, the realm of God grows in a steady and sure, but imperceptible way. These parables express encouragement to action, counsel to patience, and hope for the future. They speak of hiddenness, and growth and end with a vision of nations and people finding shelter in the kingdom of God. Reading from the fourth chapter of the gospel according to Mark. Jesus also said, the kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces itself First the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle, because the harvest has come. He also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which, when sown upon the ground, is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up, becomes the greatest of all shrubs, puts forth large branches, so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them to accept parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. And And from from the the world around us, a poem by Rita Joe entitled, I Lost My Talk. I lost my talk, the talk you took away, when I was a little girl at Shuben Kedi School. You snatched it away. I speak like you. I think like you. I create like you. The scrambled ballad about my word. Two ways I talk. Both ways I say. Your way is more powerful. So gently I offer my hand and ask, let me find my talk so I can reach you about me. And a reading by Richard Wegemese in his work entitled Embers, this reading has been used to explain why, for so many, the Kamloops School News is sinking in, far more than previous feelings on the subject. So Bill will take one part and I'll take the old woman. You always repeat things three times. Just the important things. Why? I hear you the first time. No, you listen the first time, you hear the second, and you feel the third time. I don't get it. 
When you listen, you become aware. That's for your head. When you hear, you awaken. That's for your heart. When you feel, it becomes a part of you. That's for your spirit. Three times, it's so you learn to listen with your whole being. That's how you learn. Here end the readings from Holy Scripture and from the world around us. And for these words and insights, we give God thanks and praise. Thank you, Bill and Nancy. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. If you keep track of such things, you may have noticed that the name for this Sunday, Indigenous Peoples Sunday, changed three years ago from Aboriginal Sunday. This is in keeping, I am told, with evolving language to more appropriately describe the first peoples of this land. However, during the giving of this sermon, I will vary the language, understanding that there isn't really one universally acceptable descriptor. I learned this from Gloria Cook, an indigenous elder who spoke to me and several hundred other delegates at a United Church Conference annual general meeting a few years ago. She began her talk by telling us of a conversation she had with a relative about the various names given to their people by settlers over the generations. Her relative said, we have been called Indians, Natives, First Peoples, Aboriginal, and now Indigenous. Well, she chuckled, Indigenous is a word whose root means sprung from the earth. So now when people call me indigenous, I feel like I'm a potato. Let me share a story with you. Ryan Duick, pastor at Lethbridge Mennonite Church, tells of the time he met Leroy and his wife, Sandy. As he sat down in the living room of their rundown apartment, he noticed this little old man who had come tottering into the living room. He soon learned this was Leroy, who wasn't old at all, only 49. To say that the years had not been kind would be the height of understatement. His body was thin and frail. He had a few remaining teeth and a nose that had been broken many times. The knobby knees and stick legs emerging from under his shorts revealed numerous scars. His movements were painfully slow. He slumped down on the couch looking like one of the most defeated human beings Duick had ever met. They began to talk and a painfully familiar story emerged. Leroy had spent a bit of time at residential school but ran away. Eventually he went to a white foster family. They didn't like me, he said. They beat me, so I ran again. I've been living on the streets since I was 16. The story got worse. He told of near-death experiences of crippling addiction to alcohol and drugs, of a long train of broken relationships of kids and grandkids that he rarely saw Duet glanced at the walls that surrounded them. There were paintings of Mary and Jesus. There was an old yellowing poster of a powwow. As well, there was a picture of a basketball team with a strong, happy-looking, black-haired young man front and center. Beside the photo were some awards and plaques with the words, Most Improved Player, Honors Student, Player of the Month, and beside these, an obituary. Duick swallowed hard. Is this your son? Sandy nodded. What happened, he asked, as he inwardly braced himself for the response he knew was coming. He killed himself, Sandy said. She looked out the window. The tears flowed freely. Just one story among thousands of such stories. 
The legacy of racism and colonialism and the resultant family dysfunction that through the many generations to this very day continues. And of course, racism in this part of the world still rages intensely and sometimes violently. We have witnessed the racial tensions between whites and blacks in the United States and in Canada. We recall the protests in Ferguson, Missouri after the police shooting of an unarmed 18-year-old black man which led to the movement known as Black Lives Matter. And we recall the murder of George Floyd just over a year ago, followed by demonstrations and marches. And here in Canada, early in 2017, a young man gunned down six individuals as they were praying in a mosque. We have witnessed increasing hate crimes against Asian Canadians and recently were shocked and sickened by the news of the discovery of the remains of 215 children at the former residential school in Kamloops. And we are still reeling from the attack on a Muslim family in London, Ontario that left four dead and one young boy injured and orphaned. We're living in a time when xenophobia, the fear of strangers, the mistrust and dislike of those who are perceived as different feels like it is on the rise. In a world where doors are being slammed shut to unwanted foreigners, where racist attitudes continue to plague Western society, I am uplifted, I am heartened to be part of a denomination, a church that is trying to redress past wrongs and is participating in actions to promote a welcoming, inclusive, and reconciling spirit. So today I would like to explore our role as the church to be an instrument of reconciliation in the world. How we can plant seeds of reconciliation, to use Jesus' metaphor. And by God's grace, come to witness to and be part of the growth and flourishing of God's realm. That realm of peace and justice and love. I want us to think how we are called to this way of life, this way of God's kingdom in relationship with First Nation peoples. Listen to these words of Paul in his second letter to the Corinthians. For the love of Christ urges us on since we believe that Christ died for everyone. We also believe that we have all died to the old life we used to live. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live to please themselves. Instead, they will live to please Christ. So we have stopped evaluating others by what the world thinks about them. What this means, Paul goes on to say, is that those who become Christians become new persons. They are not the same anymore, for the old life is gone. A new life has begun. All the newness of life is from God, who brought us back to God's self through what Christ did. And God has given us the ministry of reconciliation and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making an appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Paul is saying that if we want to become an instrument of reconciliation in our broken and divided world, our first step is to truly reconcile with God. One of the signs that we have been reconciled with God, again in the words of Paul, this time in his letter to the Romans, is that we have a sense of God's love streaming into our hearts. As God's love is poured out into our hearts, and as we spill over with that love, we become more loving with others. Jesus taught that the mark of a person who is truly his disciple is not having a tattoo of a cross on your ankle, although there's nothing wrong with that. Not a set of doctrinal beliefs as instructive as they might be. But the mark that a person really knows God is love. Jesus said, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Theologian and teacher at Yale University, Miroslav Volf, was born and raised in an ethnically divided and war-torn Croatia. 
He contends that ethnic cleansing is the result of a false sense of purity of one's own race or bloodline. In Canada, part of the reason that colonizers from Europe stole the land of Aboriginal peoples, steal seems to be the plainest word, as the native people were physically forced off the land and never properly compensated. And also many were subjected to violent treatment as evidenced by the residential school system. Part of the reason was that indigenous people were seen as savages, even viewed as less than human. Many of the colonizers justified heinous acts toward First Nations people because they saw themselves as superior due to a false sense of purity. Miroslav Wolf observes that when Jesus began his ministry, he remade and renamed things. He called things clean that others called unclean. He named acceptable what others named unacceptable. He loved and included people that others hated and excluded. So Paul, understanding Christ's spirit of inclusion and love for all people, says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. He declares, from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. In other words, we are to see others differently because what we see is shaped by our relationship with God in Christ informed by who we are as followers of Christ. One of the clearest signs that we are being changed by Christ is that we don't see people through a racist lens and instead see the beauty of God's image in others, particularly those who are different from us. So one of our core values is reconciling. And as a faith community, part of that reconciling involves a committed response to Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action. Somewhat surprisingly, perhaps, of the 94 calls to action, only five are addressed to the church, and one of those is addressed to the Roman Catholic Pope specifically. So we are concerned with four. In the interest of time, I will refer to just one, Call to action number 59. This call to action calls upon churches to develop ongoing education strategies to ensure their respective congregations learn about the church's role in colonization, the history and legacy of residential schools, and why apologies to former residential school students were and continue to be so necessary. Now, I understand that you in this congregation have done some work in this area, but I will be encouraging you to consider further educational opportunities and events as they became, become available in keeping with these calls to action. I am planning to lead a study in the fall and hope that many of you might be inclined to give serious and prayerful thought to participating. What else can we do? Well, we can advocate for the federal government and the churches to live out the practical actions that flow from apologies and from the findings of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We can continue to listen, to hear, to feel when First Nation people pour out their heartfelt and heartbreaking personal stories. In so doing, we are saying, I see you, I truly see you as Christ sees you. We can embrace the beauty of Native cultures and learn the wisdom of Native spirituality. In so doing, we honor Indigenous peoples and we enrich ourselves. Now, I've heard it said, and I, I know that some would argue, that there has been more than enough of acknowledging what happened in the past, that they have heard more than enough stories of First Nations peoples, and that we should move past that and get on with moving into the future together. Quang Cho, a Korean man and United Church minister, responds this way. As a person who lived and learned the history of the Korean Peninsula, I can clearly see the viewpoint that the shameful history of oppression by other peoples is just a history, so we should talk of the coming future instead of history, is the viewpoint of the oppressor. Cho refers to the wisdom of what he calls Wango Jishin, the wisdom that we should learn about the past and 
Cherish it in our bosom. Cherish it in our bosom. And then we can find the future. That is the perspective of the oppressed. God calls us to continue to acknowledge and understand the past from the oppressed's point of view. To hear, to listen, then to feel, as stated in the reading we heard earlier. We do so even as we also take steps that lead to a new and brighter future. We are called to plant seeds of compassion, understanding, respect, honor, and love. And by God's grace, those seeds will one day sprout and grow and eventually blossom into the glorious reality of full reconciliation. Brian Duick, as he sat with Leroy and Sandy in that ocean of sadness, set out in that little rowboat of prayer. He joined hands with the couple and prayed for healing, for peace for strength, for any kind of goodness and joy to find its way into all their pain and confusion. Duick thanked God for Leroy's faith, even in the midst of a life of struggle. Yeah, amen, Leroy mumbles at this point. Duick prayed for some shred of hope and light for these two dear persons so well acquainted with darkness and despair. Duick told them how sorry he was that the church bearing Jesus' name had been involved in such awful stories for their people. It's okay, Leroy said. I don't blame the church. I'm not sure we would have done any better if we were the ones in power. I don't know. Power. It does something to people. He paused. Then he said, you know, I think if we all just realize we're the same, that none of us is any better than another, we could fix a lot of stuff. (laughs) Leroy's right. We can fix a lot of stuff. As we go about this ministry of reconciliation to which God calls us, as we go about our work as ambassadors for Christ, we plant sacred seeds in the dead earth of racism and hatred, and by God's grace, grow from it God's realm of justice, peace, and love. May it be so. Amen. The hymn of response for today's service is a video presentation that is shared to us by Golden Ear United Church of Vancouver, BC. They are presenting God Weeps, or Voices number 78. God weeps at love with hell at strength misused, at children's innocence abused, until we change the way we love God weeps. God bleeds at anger's fist, at trust betrayed, at women battered and afraid. Until we change the way we win, God bleeds. God cries at hungry mouths, at running sores, at creatures dying without cause. Until we change the way we care, God cries. God waits for stones to melt, for peace to see, for hearts to hold each other's need, until we understand the Christ God As we have been loved, so may we love others. As we have received from God's hand blessings beyond measure, 
may we also generously share as we are able with one another and God's world. What can I do? What can I bring? What can I say? What can I sing? I'll sing with joy. I'll say a prayer. I'll bring my love. I'll do my share. Let us pray. Gracious God, whatever we have is from you. Our offerings return but a small portion of what you have given us. Use what we offer in our daily lives, our resources, our time, our talents, and what is in our hearts to help in the healing of your broken world. Amen. Join our hearts and our minds in prayer. Creator God, Great Spirit, we greet you this day with thanks for the blessings of our lives and for the blessings of the people in our lives, in our communities, in our world. On this Father's Day, we thank you for fathers and for those who have fathered us in loving ways showing us how to live our lives in goodness and kindness. On this Indigenous Peoples Sunday, we pray for the original peoples of this land. We think with gratitude about the welcome Indigenous peoples gave to the first visitors who arrived here from other parts of the world and settled in this place we call Canada. We imagine that there must have been misunderstanding and hardship in these early relationships. But we also know that working relationships, bonds of friendship, and even bonds of kinship and love grew out of these early encounters. There was agreement between many Indigenous and non-Indigenous people to share these sacred lands in a covenantal relationship and to live side by side in peace as neighbours, respecting each other as communities of peoples with different customs and traditions and unique understandings of their relationship with you, yet created each and every one in your own image. Oh dear God, we lament that over time a different relationship evolved, one that perpetrated injustices and oppression against indigenous peoples steeped in racist attitudes. As we learn of the violence experienced by indigenous peoples at the hands of government, churches, and the settler society, we experience a variety of emotions. Anger, sadness, guilt, frustration, and we are left searching for answers, looking for a way forward. We pray that with compassion and determination, we non-Indigenous people will continue to make ourselves aware of the impact of racist colonial institutions and policies that suppressed the expression of Indigenous culture, tradition, and language. We pray for your healing and life-giving presence to all who have suffered directly or indirectly from systemic injustice, such as those who experienced the abuses of residential schools and the 60s scoop. 
We also pray for well-meaning teachers and loving adoptive parents who did their best to offer support and care in their classrooms or in their homes, while in retrospect may feel anguished or confused about the systemic injustice of which they were often unwittingly a part. As faithful disciples of Christ, we long to know what we can do to best show that we love our neighbors as ourselves. Help us to use our gifts, our knowledge, our positions in society, and our strength in Christ as a community of faith to support our neighbors, no matter their difference of race, color, sexual orientation, religion, place of origin, or ethnic identity. Give us humility to accept the wisdom and the leading of Indigenous people in seeking solutions and in making positive changes. Holy Spirit, fill us with the power and the courage to trust in you and to trust in others. Help us to trust the deep wisdom and traditional knowledge that you have gifted to our Indigenous neighbours. Help us to accept and embrace the gift of learning from Indigenous tradition that we may broaden and deepen our understanding of how to live with one another, to share resources, to put our complementary skills to work together, and most of all, to build our common desire to live in wholeness together as your beloved peoples. We ask, O oh God, that you will help us to be among those who are active in living out the gospel values of respect, justice, kindness, selfless love, and right relations for all. And now, as you have so graciously heard this prayer of one for many, now we ask you to hear the individual silent prayers we offer for places, people, and matters of concern to us this day. Oh God, whose good creation which you love includes all peoples in every corner of the world. Hear us now as we say aloud and together the, the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our, our Father, Father, our Mother, Mother who, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy kingdom, kingdom come, come. Thy will, will be done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this, this day our daily bread, bread and, and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as, as we, we forgive, forgive those who trespass, trespass against us. us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And our next hymn is from Voices United, number 603. In loving partnership we come. Please. 
Surround yourself in the Spirit. God is with us. Surround yourself in the light. God is with us. Surround yourself in the wisdom. God is with us. Surround yourself in the love. God is with us. Be brave, be strong, be humble. God is with us. Go now in the peace of Christ. We go to live in the way of Christ. And are going forth him today. And this season is from 381, Voices United, Spirit of Life. Dyson will sing us out for the postlude today, continuing on with his beautiful Natives Lament. Thank you, Mr. Dyson. Hey. 